Long before ethnic cleansing began in Bosnia, it had already started in Kosovo. Since at least February 1990, Serbian police and paramilitary units have brutally repressed Albanian strikes and protests. The Serbs have closed Albanian schools, courts, and newspapers. 60,000 Serbian army troops have reportedly turned Pristina, Kosovo's capital, into an armed camp. Some two million Albanians make up a large majority of Kosovo's population, 85 to 90 percent. Yet they no longer have the right to study or even to have street signs in their own language. As in Bosnia, Serb forces in Kosovo appear to be engaged in a deliberate campaign to terrorize the Albanian majority, which is mostly Muslim. The family is getting beaten. Uh, every day or every night, especially they're doing all this terror overnight, two o'clock or three o'clock in the morning. Sali Musa is president of the Albanian Cultural Center and Mosque in Patterson, New Jersey. How many people do you think have been killed so far? Well, what we know is close to 200, but uh, they are in the jails. And with beating them and, and persecuting them, they are leaving Kosovo. They go into the houses and they ask for arms. And they say, if you don't have the, the arm by tomorrow night, we will kill all the family or you leave Kosovo. So this is the words that we're getting from, from a lot of people. There have been reports of Serbian jet fighters flying over Kosovo. Right. I saw them with my own eyes. I was there. Why are they doing that? To scare the people scared of people just saw the people can believe that they will start the war any minute so something would happen some corners so they can find uh, the way to kill them kill them all and again this is a kind of tactic used to terrorize people right. and pressure them to right. leave to press them from, from leaving Serbs and Albanians have been fighting over Kosovo almost as long as they've lived there hundreds, if not thousands, of years. Like almost everything else in the Balkans, their differences are rooted in centuries of ethnic and religious conflict and differing interpretations of history. The origins of the conflict are now largely lost in the mists of time. But the current tensions go back just a couple of decades to the Tito era. In 1974, Yugoslavia's communist leader recognized the Albanian majority in Kosovo by granting the province autonomy from Serbia. For the first time, Albanian Muslims had virtual control over Kosovo's internal affairs. But Serbs, both in Kosovo and in Serbia itself, could never accept Tito's decision. They view Muslims as infidels, and Kosovo as the cradle of their civilization, where Christianity was first introduced to the Serbs nearly 2,000 years ago. The Serbs' resentment toward the Albanians reached a crescendo in 1989, when Serbs by the hundreds of thousands converged on an ancient battlefield to commemorate the Battle of Kosovo. Serbia lost that battle 600 years ago, but the loss to an invading army of Muslim Turks is still a symbol to the Serbian nation, and Orthodox Serbs have vowed to avenge their defeat ever since. Serbian President Slobodan Milosevic, long a communist functionary, saw the rising tide of Serbian nationalism as a political opportunity. He promised to revoke Kosovo's autonomy and reassert Serb control over Kosovo's police and political institutions. Vyacheslav Simic, a Serb interpreter and journalist, was forced into exile by the communists in 1988. He's now one of Milosevic's most vocal opponents. Yet even he approves of the Serbian president's decision to revoke Kosovo's autonomy. The decision by Slobodan Milosevic to revoke the autonomy of Kosovo was very popular in Serbia because it finally showed some strength on the Serbian side to stand, for, stand up for their rights. Serbs have been humiliated, slaughtered, killed, terrorized, intimidated, put down, for at least 60 years now, since 1941. In Kosovo. In Kosovo, in Serbia, in Macedonia, in Bosnia, in Herzegovina, in Croatia, in Slovenia, 
everywhere on the territory of the former Yugoslavia. It was in Kosovo where the Serbs moved first to redress their long-standing grievances. This tape, smuggled out of the country, shows the aftermath of a 1991 police raid on several private homes in Kosovo. 36 Albanians were reportedly arrested, some of them beaten, their homes destroyed. Albanians call what's happening to them quiet ethnic cleansing. Unlike Bosnia, Serb forces in Kosovo have not yet laid siege to cities or moved whole populations out of rural areas. Instead, they've set up a police state to intimidate and terrorize the Albanian majority. In one particularly gruesome incident, hundreds of Albanian school children were hospitalized in 1990 after being stricken by a mysterious illness. Albanian leaders accused the Serbs of using military gas to poison the children. The incident, they say, marked the beginning of the Serb campaign to force Albanians to leave and thus reverse the ethnic and religious balance in Kosovo. I had to leave Kosovo because I had no opportunities there either to work or live normally. Agima Lichkai, now a travel agent in the Bronx, is one of thousands who've left Kosovo since the campaign of quiet ethnic cleansing began. Oppression started in 1989, full-scale oppression, oppression of Albanians. And uh, they fired uh, the, uh, me from the job, as they did for, with a uh, hundred other people who were working with me, but they abolished the parliament. They uh, took over everything there. And then I had no, no, no other choice. I uh, just uh, stay there and then wait until someone comes and search your house or, or at, at the street and to, to search you and beat you just for being an Albanian. But, you know, I had no, no future. I saw no future over there at this moment. As you know, the West has threatened to use military force in Bosnia. Has threatened to do Has, it. yes but up until now, and now it looks as if that is not going to happen. How does that affect the view, the perception, the situation in Kosovo? Well, it does affect a lot because uh, Serbs, now they see that the West uh, does not mean business. And they respect force. They respect force. Because everything what they're doing is by force. And if there is no force which stands in between them and the victims, who are getting killed, children, whatever, they're going to continue it. And they're, uh, it's not, uh, until they achieve the goal of greater Serbia, they're not going, going to stop. And in, in, when they see that in Bosnia no one is taking action, then they will continue the same thing in Kosovo. But Simic says the Albanians are also guilty of abuses, and now they're getting what they deserve. Unfortunately, I have no pictures to show how many Serbian children, nuns, uh, ordinary people were beaten up, raped, killed, slaughtered, and uh, harassed and, and, and intimidated by the Albanians in, in the last couple of years, since the journalists from the West tend to go only to the Albanian houses and to talk only to the Albanians and never take anything uh, Serbian reports uh, seriously and dismiss any allegation from the Serbs about the Albanian atrocities as uh, lies and uh, unjustified, it's very difficult to prove. And uh, children do not carry cameras and uh, are usually not taken as, as serious witnesses. How do you respond to that charge? So easily. Joseph Diaguardi is president of the Albanian American Civic League. He vehemently denies Albanians ever systematically persecuted the Serbs in Kosovo. They have used the propaganda of individual incidents to say that this was institutional against the Serbian people. There's a big difference here. What you see happening to the Albanian people is institutional. This is a state-run institutional policy of discrimination, of torture, of maiming, of raping, of human rights violations, of taking away freedom of the press, freedom of the assembly. This is not one or two incidents. How strong you are as a people. There are today... Few American officials have ever visited Kosovo, but in 1989, Congressman Tom Lantos and Diaguardi were two of the first. 
Their van was mocked by pro-American demonstrators, most of them Albanians hoping for protection from the United States. Certainly since 1989, when we saw Slobodan Milosevic march with his troops into Kosovo. Di Guardi now has his own radio program in New York, broadcasting news and comment about events in the Balkans. He believes Milosevic and the Serbs are now stepping up the pressure in Kosovo, deliberately trying to polarize the situation and undermine Albanian leader Ibrahim Rogova, who's urged Albanians not to take up arms. My greatest fear is that some group of Albanians will now say the foreign policy of the Republic of Kosovo has not worked. Thank you, Dr. Rogova, for what you've done. You're a great leader, but we cannot take any more of this. And at that point, they may somehow, who knows, get some weapons. I don't believe they have any weapons. But God forbid they decide to fire back. You will then see the fuse ignite in Kosovo to give the Serbs what they've been looking for since April of 1989, and that's an excuse to massacre this population of two million defenseless Albanians who've been looking for democracy since 1989. The Clinton administration's decision to send 300 U.S. troops to Macedonia, Kosovo's neighbor, is meant as a warning to Serbia not to expand the war south. Here in Washington and Western Europe, there's growing concern that if Kosovo is next, the fighting there would be even bloodier and more prolonged than in Bosnia. There's also concern that a war in Kosovo would almost certainly draw in Kosovo's neighbors. Even as tensions and emotions rise, most Albanians in the United States continue to pray for peace. They know that if war breaks out in Kosovo, thousands will be killed. Yet they believe the Serbs are trying to provoke them and in that way create a pretext for more repression. They warn that if the situation in Kosovo is not quickly diffused, it too, like Croatia and Bosnia, could soon explode.